Okay. Um, I guess we can get started. Um, good morning and welcome to the panel presentation, Hampton Plantation, the lynching of Howard Cooper and the Freedom Trail, centering community and creating connections. I'm Nicholas Crary, and I am the vice president of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. And I also serve as the uh, chair of the uh, Reconciliation Committee on the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I'm joining you today from La Crosse, Wisconsin, but I am pleased to have the opportunity to, to be with you this morning and to introduce our panelists. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in and make sure that we have enough time for the presentations and the wonderful conversation that I know will happen following those presentations. Um, Nancy Goldring is the president of the Northeast Towson Improvement Association in historic East Towns at Towson, Maryland. Um, which is a descendant community of families formerly enslaved at Hampton Plantation by Maryland's 15th governor. She is a seventh generation resident of one of Baltimore County's oldest African American communities. She holds a bachelor's in philosophy from Morgan State, go Bears, and I'm wearing my Bears kit today, um, and an MA in religious studies from Howard University, go Bisons. Um, Jennifer Lyles is, oh, and I should also say that Nancy is also co-leader of the Baltimore County Coalition of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project and a recent member of the um, executive board of the, the Maryland Lynch Memorial Project. So I get to work with her in a number of capacities. Um, Jennifer Lyles is a public historian whose work focuses on the lives of Maryland residents. Her research includes the lives of industrial workers, 19th century immigrants and populations and neighborhoods, local African-American community history and other local histories. She received her bachelor's of science from Stevenson's University in public history and a bachelor of science in computer science from Villa Julie College. Amy Millen is the co-founder and co-leader of the Baltimore County Coalition of the Maryland Lynch Memorial Project. And she is also a member of the MLMP board. She, yeah, let's see, yeah, what else? Yes, she received her MSW from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master of Arts in Cultural Sustainability from Goucher College. And with that, I will turn things over to Amy for the first presentation. Thank you, Nick. I'm going to try and minimize. <laughs> Good job. Move. We'll see if that stays out of the way. We might have to move that little block around off and on. And is there anything else I need to do? All right, we're good. Okay. So thank you, Nick, for the introduction and for framing our conversation this morning. Um, before we dive into our presentation, the three of us want to express our appreciation to the members of the Baltimore County Coalition of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. Without them, we wouldn't be here today. We also want to express our appreciation and give respect to the descendants of lynching victims, as well as the descendants of lynch mobs, especially those who have shared their stories with us in our work. I'm going to talk a bit about community and the way that community members came together to commemorate Howard Cooper's lynching and how that collaboration resulted in a deepening commitment to each other, to our work, into new endeavors. But first, who is community and what is community? I really think we could spend the rest of today and tomorrow the whole conference unpacking what community is, but we believe that community is about people. It's about our stories. It's about being heard. It's about our connections to each other. It's about our past 
and how our past have informed our present and how all of it speaks together and speaks to our future. Community is also about our cultural health, our vitality. In the Sabonhu Somme states in the closing words on the passage on this slide, the community is that grounding place where people come and share their gifts and receive from others. In November of 2018, I joined a group of 10 women on a trip to Georgia and Alabama, much like many groups are doing today. We visited historic sites and museums that told different parts of the story of the civil rights movement in the United States. I returned home to Baltimore and I decided I was no longer gonna remain silent. I've since used my voice as members of several communities, partnering with others to be peaceful yet firm disruptors of centuries of racial terror. One of the names on the Maryland Monument at the National Monument for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, had been lynched six miles from where I lived. He was just two years younger than my own child. His name is Howard Cooper, a 15-year-old boy who was lynched in 1885, dragged from the county jail by a mob. Jenny Lyles is going to speak to the details of that horrific event and frame his story further, as well as to begin to identify the ways it connects the Hampton Plantation and the proposed Road to Freedom Trail. But first, for context, Baltimore County actually wraps around the city of Baltimore. They're two completely different jurisdictions. The city is not part of the county. The county is not part of the city. Across the water, Chesapeake Bay from um, Baltimore, Baltimore County is the eastern shore of Maryland. Further down would be the eastern shore of Virginia. The historic jail pictured here is where Howard Cooper was lynched. It sits in the county seat of Towson, which is noted by the green circle. And the um, historic jail is at the bottom point of that green circle. This is all directly north of what is now the Baltimore City border. Much of the land that is now known as Baltimore County was once a vast and complex plantation owned by the Ridgely family. Sometimes it's called Hampton Plantation, Hampton Mansion, or Ridgely Plantation. We might all use the terms interchangeably. Today, it's officially known as the Hampton National Historic Site and is part of the National Park Service. At its height, the plantation encompassed nearly 25,000 acres, and from the colonial period through 1864, the Ridgelys enslaved over 500 people. Hampton Plantation extended north to the Pennsylvania border and wow. northeast along Interstate 95. The Ridgely family, their friends, the enslaved people, and the descendants of all three of those groups as well as many of the geographic sites in and around Towson are all connected to Howard Cooper's story and the Freedom Trail that Jenny and Nancy are gonna be discussing later. The story of the Baltimore County Coalition is one of a community-based approach. The approach centers community and the work is led by community members. It's also about a series of partnerships it can feel and it can appear messy and organic at times, but the collaborative approach is ultimately empowering and it's strengths-based. Raising awareness of Howard Cooper's lynching and coalescing to create change started with folks in Baltimore County coming together around a common cause. These individuals who largely did not know each other, three of us didn't know each other, build a new type of community. One that spans generations, demographics, backgrounds, and at each stage of development, we have explored organically, what are we all bringing to this new type of community, this new coalition and collaboration? What are our strengths? What is missing and who is missing? And really how can we reach out and invite more people into the conversation and into the work? <clears throat> so we begin in 2018 when Will Schwartz Nick Creary, our moderator this morning, and a few others founded the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. The directive these founders gave themselves and ultimately challenged the state of Maryland was to work to advance the cause of racial reconciliation or reckoning in Maryland by working to research and document the history of racial terror lynching in the state, to advocate for public acknowledgement of these murders, 
to support the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which as an aside was established in 2019 by House Bill 307 and tasked with researching cases of racially motivated lynchings, as well as to hold public meetings and regional hearings where a lynching of an Afri African-American by a white mob have been documented. It is the only such commission in the United States. The fourth and final directive of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project is to honor and dignify the lives of the victims, such as Howard Cooper. The small group knew that they couldn't do it alone. The work is done with county-based coalitions in 14 of the 17 counties in Maryland where a known lynching has occurred. The coalitions are all volunteer, and each one is unique in how it was formed and how it operates. For example, the Baltimore County Coalition has over 200 members, of which 25 to 30 regularly attend monthly meetings and support the coalition's programs and initiatives. The Maryland Lynching Memorial Project serves as the fiscal sponsor and also advocates for the coalition. This slide highlights the partnerships that exist between the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, the commission, as I spoke to earlier, the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and then in red, all of the different counties that have a known coalition. So there's lots of communication that's going amongst and between all of them. The series of slides has provided a visual of the multiple partners and voices of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project and highlighted here specifically is the Baltimore County Coalition of which the three, the three of us are members of. These are just a few of the partners. So we can't get everybody on the slide. I just want to call out, we are we're working with you know, the county government, um, public schools, the public library, neighborhood associations, such as the Northeast Health and Improvement Association of which Jenny, um, sorry, Nancy is the president of, um, <laughs> local colleges and universities, such as Goucher College, and then I really want to call out community researchers and leaders past and present. Without the work of the community-based researchers from the past, we would never be where we are today as a coalition. We want to pay respect to the, the elders and, and the um, our, our forefathers and foremothers who have done work before us. Um, and that's really important. So you can see that there's many voices at the table it requires listening skills to discern the layers of expertise and resources that are found within this newfound coalition community. We learned quickly that we have expertise and resources related to oral history, archives, storytelling, social activism, education and mediation, social and mental health, government, policy, the arts, and so much more. And we did this, we, we discerned these skill sets and these resources simply by building our relationships, building trust, taking time to get to know each other. And I wanna reiterate that this is a grassroots sort of flipped model, community-based approach. As community members have coalesced, it has remained important to consider um, how we meet, our meeting structure, the spaces that we're using, the social dynamics, the power dynamics that might be at play, motivation for being involved. And as one of the facilitators, I consider the question, how can I be a fair and equitable facilitator when communities, with, within communities, while attending to the cultural and historical forces that have impacted the partnerships, ones that have been informed by centuries of trauma, of hurt, of pain, and also have been deeply informed by silence. An important part of our community building has been to intentionally take time for conversation such that we do continue to work on building that trust, that we continue to learn from each other, and that we continue to take care of one another. I'm gonna take just a couple more minutes, um, and I wanna share a timeline and some visuals of the coalition's growth. Shortly before the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project um, was founded, Will Schwartz, as I mentioned earlier, Nick Creary, our moderator, and Jenny Lyles, as well as some others, participated in a soil collection for Howard Cooper outside of that historic jail. The image on the slide was taken on that day, and it was a result of the partnership with Equal Justice Initiative and their Community Remembrance Project. The soil from that the collection on that day now resides in the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. Approximately a year and a half later, um, we hosted a public community forum in Baltimore County. 
um, Gallagher College was nice enough to give us their space as part of a you know brand new partnership. Um, we wanted to reach out to a large um, as many people as possible. So of course we sent out press releases, social media, word of mouth. You know, we asked the government to post it on their websites. At the end of this uh, very wintry and icy day where we had a meeting, um, the, the agreement was, yes, we need to form a coalition. So the community is the one who determined what was going to happen. So the next couple of months we spent meeting in the communities. Um, more people kept showing up. We identified goals and resources that are available to us. We used EJI's Community Remembrance Project again for, um, as a guideline for structure as we work towards planning for the historic marker for Howard Cooper. COVID, March 2020, we're two months old. <laughs> we have to go virtual and we like don't even know each other. Um, so we had to adjust our immediate goals. We had to postpone the historic marker installation and we turned instead to community education programming. We really leveraged Zoom quite a bit at this point. Um, and we continue to build relationships at the community level, as well as initiating partners partnerships at the institutional level. The coalition at that time also brought forward the connections of historic racial trauma of lynching to the current events of the spring and summer of 2020. That of the continued patterns, the behavior and behaviors of racial terror, systemic racism in the environment, education, economic development, the police, and more. Again, in the stories of Howard Cooper and the Freedom Trail, you will hear these themes repeat themselves. So images are important. Who, who the heck are we, right? Um, and public gatherings are really important for a community-based coalition. We want to be in contact with the community. We're not just living on Zoom or in our little meeting sites. So we see that through demonstrations that we, we have organized. Um, an annual remembrance service on July 13th for Howard Cooper. Um, county government sponsored fairs and festivals, getting ourselves out there in public. Um, the marker installation that we finally had held in May of 2021, a year after originally planned, and then our annual forums that we still hold as a way to bring in new people. So public gatherings is really important. The other is partners and collaborators. Um, as mentioned, the Hampton Mansion is now part of the National Park Service and that's the upper right hand um, image it is on the, what's called the lower farm of Hampton Plantation where the enslaved people were, were living. Um, this is on Goucher College campus, the lower left hand corner. So, um, Goucher College, sit, College sits on part of the land that was part of the Hampton Plantation. Um, and this is an old lime kiln. And so we're, we're working with them as well. Um, county and state leaders in the middle. And then um, the Truth and Reconciliation hearing that was held this past June of 2022 in Baltimore County. The final slide here offers a short list of some tangible outcomes and initiatives that have resulted from the, by the work of the Baltimore County Coalition. His work is iterative, it's give and take, and it's filled with constant adjustments. Through it all, people keep showing up. Um, more people keep coming. The idea of the coalition started with four people. As I said earlier, we have over 200. We knew the historic marker was not gonna, for Howard Cooper, was not gonna be the end. We have felt that it's important to trace the structural inequality and inequity, Howard Cooper's lynching within Baltimore County over the 138 years, and to name that inequality that is continuing in communities today. Within all that work, we must remind ourselves that we are still a newly formed community ourselves, community as coalition. And we have to maintain relationships and ties with our own communities and recognize that how those ties and form who we are in this newly shared space. Ultimately, the coalition has been and remains focused on building community and on a common purpose, while simultaneously working collaboratively, collaboratively for social change and restorative justice, which does speak to that proposed Road to Freedom Trail. But now I'm going to invite Jenny Lyles to discuss how past and present, past and current research ensures that a complete story is told 
and one that locates Howard Cooper's lynching within the community context. Jenny. Thank you, Amy. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about research. I am a public historian and research is kind of what I do daily. So actually, before I get into that, I want to explain my role in the project. I came to the project in 2018 for the soil collection. Um, I was brought there by my professor who had written a paper about Howard Cooper's lynching and he invited me along to the soil collection. I brought with me at the time my 12 year old um, who is now sitting on the front row and is getting ready to turn 18. So she's been with me the entire time. But I felt it was really important for her to understand because this was her history. She's a Baltimore County resident. I grew up in the city. And um, like Amy was saying, the city and the county are very separate. That wasn't always the case. The, the county was part county seat was actually in Baltimore City in 1851. So that was pretty new history when this lynching took place. And so um, while my history was different, hers was not. And I wanted her who went to Towson, was going to go to Towson High School to understand this history that was blocks away from where she was going to attend. So I am one of old, old ancient maps, but I have some maps here to show you and, and help you understand uh, what it looked like back then. Um, the red down here, that's Baltimore City. And the blue right above that is uh, where the Towson location is and further north, that's kind of the area. And so why I have it blown up to the right is that you see the words Towson Town, you see Brooklynville, you see Rockland. This is all in a vicinity of just a couple miles. And that's an important grasping of where this entire story is going to take place. So, let me tell you how in the next couple, couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you three parts of a single story about a lynching, a church, and a community that together tell us a broader story about racial violence and injustice. So how is this connecting? We had a soil collection, and the question I asked then was, who was Howard Cooper, and what was his life prior to being lynched? Then I did projects with the Trinity Episcopal Church in Towson that was founded by the Ridgely family that Amy mentioned from the Hampton Plantation. And my question was to them, what was your history? And their question back to me was, how do we repair and pay reparations to the community surrounding our church? At that point, they didn't know how deep their connections to the community was and how deep their connections to the Ridgely Plantation was. And then my last question, and this is my ongoing question, is about historic East Towson. What is the history that needs to be told? How do we tell that history? And whose story is being told as we go forward? So now I'm going to tell you the actual lynching of Howard Cooper. <laughs> Howard Cooper was accused of the assault, rape, and attempted murder of a 20-year-old white woman named Katie Gray on April 2nd, 1885. Howard encountered Gray on the road, leaving the train station where she had dropped off her sister. Gray claimed Cooper called her by name. She recognized him, but continued her walk home. She alleged that after she ignored him, Cooper pursued her, beat her, dragged her into the woods, and assaulted her for over a three-hour period until he was frightened away by one of her dogs. He was discovered four days later hiding in the barn of the Ryder family. This family was important to Howard, and this is the reason why he sought shelter there. His family had worked there, his grandparents and his mother, and his aunt continued to work there as the cook. His parents, when he was born, were actually living on the land of the Ryder family. After he was captured, he was taken to the Towson jail, which we saw earlier, where there were people gathering and demanding that he be handed over. A lynching at the time was already being discussed. He was removed to Baltimore City, which that happened many times during multiple uh, lynchings that took place in Maryland. People would be removed to Baltimore City, where a crowd also began to gather, but that's where his trial took place. Cooper's case was tried on May 20th, and the all-white jury found Cooper guilty within minutes and without leaving the jury box. <laughs> and the judge sentenced him on May 21st to die by hanging. Cooper admitted, and Gray agreed, 
that he did attack her, but that he did not rape her. This was the important admission because the rape charge was what sing singled the death penalty. Without that, he would have just had prison sentence. He was scheduled to be hanged at the end of July. At this time, he was sent back to the Towson jail to await his sentencing. Mm -hmm. Howard's lawyers, with the help of Reverend, Har Reverend Harvey Johnson, appealed to the Maryland Court of Appeals, where they argued that the verdict should be set aside because of the partiality of the jury, being that they were all white. When the Court of Appeals upheld the lower court's ruling, his lawyers declared their intention to appeal to the federal courts and to take the case to the United States Supreme Court to argue that Cooper's civil and constitutional rights had been violated based on the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. Harvey Johnson and an African-American organization called the Progressive Association drafted a letter to members of the African-American community asking them to contribute to Cooper's legal expenses to fund an appeal. This fundraising alarmed certain members of the white community who were convinced of Cooper's guilt and feared that an appeal to the US Supreme Court could mean that he could go unpunished on a technicality. On July 12th, a Sunday, this day that the funds were raised for the appeal, about 75 masked men approached the Towson jail. We later learned that the head of that mob was a man named William Milton Offit. He was a lawyer and a prominent citizen of Towson. The mob was used a flagpole that they had taken from the courthouse to break in the back door, then smashed the lock on Cooper's jail cell, forcing it open, where Howard lay hidden under his mattress. They immediately put a rope around his neck and dragged him out through the back door into the jail yard where they hanged him from the nearest tree. Howard's appeal was set to be sent the next day, the day of his lynching. The lynching stopped the process and Howard Cooper was collected by his mother that morning around 10 a.m. A train had come through that morning around nine and slowed to allow the passengers to view his hanging body. This was the story of Howard Cooper. So um, I'm gonna just explain a little bit about the soil collection. Like I said, I attended because I asked about Howard Cooper and who was his mother. At the time, there was no um, recognition of his mother by name. Uh, there was never any kind of newspaper article about his mother. And so that weekend I went home and I discovered that his mother was named Henrietta and that um, he had a twin brother named Henry who had died before he was 10 and that he had lived next to the Ryder family, lived in Ruxton, lived in Rockland, those two names I showed you, and lived in Towson. His mother at the time of his lynching lived in the property next to the Tow um, Towson jail. So she said that when she heard the lynch mob go through, she knew what was happening. She was uh, sitting in her um, home with a few of her friends who had gathered. So um, she was very aware of what was happening to her son. And my thought process when uh, I was at the soil collection and after I learned this was as a mother, uh, the pain that she must have been going through and knowing she was helpless in it. And then to later find out that she had been attacked as well in 1870, the same weekend that Frederick Douglass came to Baltimore to um, celebrate the passing of the 15th Amendment. Mm -hmm. So this was very poignant to me that her attacker, a white man, was given 10 years jail sentence at the Maryland Penitentiary, which I thought was huge. But the fact that she said in one of these statements, I would like my son to see the same justice my attacker did, mm -hmm. and that she wholeheartedly believed that either her attacker or his family was most likely in that mob crowd. Mm -hmm. So she was very aware and so was the community. So again, that's what makes this branching out to the community so important. Here's the 1870 census. Up until this time, what we saw was that Howard Cooper was between 19 and 24 years old. And it was that weekend when we realized that Howard here showing that he's six months old in 1870 was just turning 15 when he was lynched or had just turned 15. 
And here he is with his mother, his aunt, his um, twin brother, and his grandparents. And they are working for the Ryder family. And in 1880, at the top, you see David Davis, Louisa Davis, that's his grandparents, that's his mom, Henrietta, and then that's him. So this is when he's 10 years old and they are still working for the family. And this is the docking book. So you see the charge, like I said earlier, the, the charge of rape was what was the signal for the death penalty. And at the very bottom, there's a memo that says, Cooper was hanged by a mob in Towson Town, June, 1885. Um, so then I went to Trinity Episcopal Church, and when I went to Trinity Episcopal Church, I wanted to utilize some of their research there, um, their archives, to see if they had any mention of Howard Cooper, because the church, at the time I had been a member of it 10 years prior, I knew that they had began before the Civil War. And they said, we don't know what we have, but it's perfect time that you're coming here because we have been charged with coming up with ways to reconcile our past and offer reparations mm -hmm. to the people within the community that we may have harmed. And I said, well, I think we can probably help each other out. So they wanted their whole history and they gave me what they had, but their whole history was missing an entire section of people. Mm -hmm. So I went into their archives to see what they didn't know whether they had or not. And what I found was that there was an African-American community that was existing within this church for a long period of time, from before the end of slavery until the 1890s. Uh, it wasn't inclusive, but they were members of the church in the sense that there were people who were married and people who were baptized. And at times, multiple generations had gone through. So when I worked through them, many stories came to light. Many very interesting stories came to light. And what we found was that the priest of this church, um, he would go over to the Hampton plantation when people were still enslaved and do the weddings and funerals and burials and, um, and baptisms there. At, it was very important, according to the Ridgeleys, that religion was brought into all of the um, plantation. But afterwards, the community that settled uh, East Towson, which is on the Eastern side of Towson, uh, the, what I showed you earlier, um, and Sandy Bottom, which was another community that no longer stands, uh, those were the communities in which African-Americans lived. And they were also very close to the church. So that relationship was still happening. And that was until a church, another church was founded. And the thought process was that people would move on to other churches. So here's just a sampling. From 1865 to 1910, there were 19 weddings that took place. And I'm going to talk about one of those people, or a set of people. And that's James H. Williams and Caroline Martin. James was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia, and he came to Maryland at a young age. Um, his bride-to-be, Caroline Martin, was born in Maryland in 1869. They married uh, through Trinity in March of 1890, and James Williams became a preacher and with others founded the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Sandy Bottom, mm -hmm. and he was their first preacher. The two would have 10 children, including William Cosmos Williams, who was born in 1900, and one of William uh, Williams' uh, children with Mary Catherine Williams, they were married in 1920. One of their nine children was Adelaide Williams Bentley, who would be instrumental in the preservation of East Towson until her death in 2020. And her granddaughter, Nancy, is here. Here's the Towson map. So before I hand it over to Nancy, just to really reiterate what East Towson is. So the, the road that's going north and south, that's York Road. So east of York Road is East Towson. West of York Road is West Towson. You can see the courthouse. I wish I had a pointer, but I don't, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You see the courthouse up there. The jail is right under this star here. Uh, the property that says Bosley, that's where um, Howard Cooper's mother was living. That's the proximity. And then East Towson is over that entire direction. Sandy Bottom is up at the top of this map. So this is all within 
a mile of each other, basically. This is how tight this community is. And it still stands looking much like this today in the sense of this is how it was built out in 1878. So this is, of course, things have changed. And Nancy can tell you about that. <laughs> This is 1898, so you can see how a little bit more um, construction has happened, especially in the downtown corridor at East House, and um, you have these subdivisions of houses that are going to come about. So I'm left with all of this knowledge, and now I want to know what to do with it, because I don't want it to sit with me, and I don't want it to sit in an archive, and I don't want to sit it in a church that's not going to be disseminated beyond their walls. So then I attack Nancy with a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> How can I be helpful? What can I do? How can I send this information out and not hold on to it? And so Nancy's very gracious and said, let's meet. And so now I have a new friend and I've been trying to get to be Nancy's friend for a long time. <laughs> this was my in, okay? Um, I sent her that email and did you know your great grandfather got married at this church? And by the way, do you wanna have lunch? <laughs> and so that was my way into her work because her work has been fascinating me since I joined the coalition. So here's my questions, and this is what I'm going forward with. The stories that connect East House into Hampton Plantation, the stories that connect East House into Sandy Bottom, the stories that connect East House into with West House, in, and the stories that connect all of Towson as a whole. How do we get all of those stories together to make sense, to be owned still by the community, but to be disseminated throughout all of Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and all of Maryland, and nationally, because these stories are not unknown and people move. And so with people's movement, I want these stories to continue to go. So with that, I leave this to Nancy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> feel more on the hot seat than uh, presenting a talk. So let's see, Amy started by talking with you about the value and the power of community. And Jenny ended by talking about the connectivity of stories and stories only occur in community, our stories only matter if we can articulate them to someone else. It's not that they don't matter, but they come alive when we can articulate those stories to another person. So in my work, as Jenny calls it, along the way, I came into the post of president of the Northeast Towson Improvement Association on literally on the heels of my grandmother's passing. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother passed at home and uh, the undertaker came for her body. And I left my home to go and pick up one of the <laughs> aunties and a neighbor was outside. And he says, well, hon, you know, you have to take over, right? And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, he says, there's nobody else. You're going to have to do it. And I thought, my grandmother's body just left the building. What is he talking about? <laughs> and so instantly I thought, no, that's not for me. And so, however, when my grandmother passed, we were in the throes of a battle against constant erosion of the community's boundaries due to unwanted, unnecessary, insensitive, and unsustainable development. And so along the way, many people, I encountered lots of people, and one of them, Donna Newhart, uh, Newberg, I think it was, suggested that I have a conversation with Will Schwartz who is the director and co-founder of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. And from that conversation, I was invited to speak with the Baltimore County Coalition at the January 2021 meeting. And I thought that that was an isolated incident. I had been <laughs> to plenty of places and I had lots of meetings sharing and hoping to gain the support of people in 
support of the community, but that was not to be. And so I remained in community, Will remained in communication with me. And before I knew it, I was attending monthly meetings for the Baltimore County Coalition of the Lynching, Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. And then before I knew it, I was on the um, co-leading with the leadership team. And then before I knew it, I was on the board. And I have to say that in retrospect, while I wasn't sure how it would be anything more than another obligation, it was in fact the community of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, as well as my own community and other communities, in fact, that were in fact bolstering our position in our cause and helping us to move forward in a very powerful way. And I am and remain very much grateful, if not indebted to the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. So I say all that to shape this conversation for you of mapping the road to freedom. And in the context of stories that connect in the context of community, one of the challenges to me about the, the plot of land, the last remaining green space, not, in, not just in East Towson, but in all of Towson, that would be destroyed for the sake of a 56 unit affordable housing development. And under the guises that we were the affluent area of the community, when in fact East Towson is affordable housing mm -hmm. for Towson, which of course happens when stories are not told, when communities are not represented at the table and those stories are not connected. And so in a conversation with the woman who directed a land trust for a pocket park next to us, she says, well, if you don't want Red Maple Place, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how there's not a trail that connects East Towson back to Hampton National Historic Site, which is where the community came from. And so one of the things that occurred to me instantly, even in the saying of that was the only way in this day and age that you're going to move forward with the history is if you make it inclusive. And so while there are, there are lots of true history um, events and, and true history tourism and black history and African-American history, what occurred for me was that this was American history, that it was not just a local conversation, but it was a national conversation and that the things that were happening in the little six blocks of historic East Towson were happening in lots of other places across America. And so the response to that needed to be just as significant. However, it, it had to be uh, what I like to call an elegant fix to a complex problem. Mm -hmm. And so then you see, and that of course brings about the slide that says in pursuit of higher ground. This could not be the old fight fought in the old way. Mm -hmm. There had to be some flavor and some nuance from the past, honoring what worked in the past, but we had to bring modern day responses to an old world problem, mostly because most people didn't know there was a problem. Mm -hmm. And so that required not just freedom, but equality, equity, and inclusion. So it's also important to share that Maryland was, is, is grounded in a conversation for exclusivity. And so there is in fact a doctrine that very few Marylanders know anything about called the Maryland Doctrine of Exclusion. I think it's fascinating that it comes to life less than 20 years after 1619. And it states, as you can see, that neither the existing black population, their descendants, nor any other black shall 
be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. It was penned by the Colony Council of its day, and I am a firm believer in what the energies are that undergird events and conversations. So here we have a genealogical flow chart. This is from the records, images notwithstanding, of the Hampton National Historic Site. This is a flow chart that the curator of Hampton gave me, showing me an unbroken line of relationship from my grandmother, who is in this, that Jenny mentioned to you, Adelaide Williams, married to Luther Bentley, born in 28, all the way back to Ann Davis and to 1791. So there is no doubt about my family's connection to enslavement and enslavement at one of the largest industrial slave complexes in the region, which was Hampton Plantation at that time. And so the thing I think is important and even more important after listening to Jenny is the value of naming. It's important that you know that I am not the lone survivor of descendants from those people who settled Towson from Hampton Plantation. In the center here, we have John Gross, and John Gross is actually standing in front of a photo of a livery carriage that his great-great-grandfather drove for the Ridgeways. Uh, you also see here, this is Amy Davis. Amy Davis, when she passed, I think was 103 <laughs> years old. And her family also was, she is also a descendant from the Hampton Plantation. Uh, however, she has passed on. I think by now she would have been like, I don't know, 110 or 12. But um, and above her is Mr. Martin and his companion, Miss Dot. They are alive today and live in the home that Mr. Martin's great grandfather built and raised 11 children in. And Mr. Martin is the 11th of those children. So you have people in the community who are still living in the community and still living in homes that their families have owned, if not built, generations ago. And here we have Genevieve Norris, who was born at Hampton. Though she was born at Hampton, obviously, after emancipation, her father was in the employ of the Ridgeleys when she was born. Miss Genevieve and her husband, Arthur Cooper, both have also passed. And above here is my grandmother, Adelaide Bentley, as Jenny mentioned, who passed in 2020. And uh, as my sister says, she got you. <laughs> it slid me a certain responsibility. And so here we see two images, both of Hampton. Uh, one is of Hampton, the mansion that was that continues to be celebrated for its Georgian architecture. It was, in fact, the largest private residence in the country at its completion. It was larger and rival Mount Vernon. However, since what we learn in studying this history is that places, countries, and even people, we are never just one thing. And so lurking in the background is this gigantic shadow of Hampton as a place that very few people, even today, know existed. And so, as we mentioned, it was a plantation. It sprawled some 25,000 acres across uh, Baltimore County and comprised largely all of Baltimore County. However, we are looking at the opportunity to create community and share stories on a trail. And so we are asking people to imagine Towson a trail town, a beautiful place. It's, all, it's already a beautiful place, a sought after place to live. It is simply a place where its true histories are being 
the only word that comes to me right now is suffocated, but not necessarily to death. And so here we have a map, which is a route on the Freedom Trail. It starts uh, chronologically here at Hampton National Historic Site. It follows across Interstate 695, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. And on to Goucher's campus. At Goucher had one time been known as the Epson Farm. And so it comes across here to what is now Goucher's campus and picks up the lime kiln that you were shown in a, in a former slide. There's also a spring house, a large farm foundation, and a depression in the ground of how you entered the property before what we know as the Laney Valley Road was a paved thoroughfare. It was just a dirt road. And if you see it now, it's hard to even imagine that. Yeah. And so you come around and you take uh, Bosley, York Road over into Sandy Bottom. This is if you're taking, now keep in mind, this is a cycling and pedestrian trail. So there are two different places from which you could approach to make your way to and from East House or Hampton. If you come through an area called Sandy Bottoms, there's the church that my great great grandfather founded with two other ministers. He was 17 years old, but the only one who could read or write his name, sign his name. And that church is now, I believe, 136 years old and is still sitting at the corner of York and Bosley. It's still sitting there because there was a community there. You didn't build churches in the middle of nowhere in commercial districts. You built them where people lived and worked and loved and played and worshiped. And so Mount Olive is here. And after you pass Mount Olive, you'll come just across the street to the Pleasant Rest Cemetery, just down the street to Howard Cooper's Memorial. You'll go across Towson Town Boulevard. The significance of Towson Town Boulevard for us is that it is where the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad train used to cut right through the center of historic East Towson. So a mammoth train, a friend of mine said to me, Nancy, all trains are big. I'm like, but you haven't seen one coming through a residential neighborhood. <laughs> and so a mammoth train comes through what we had known as Helen Road, which is now the bypass and has become in recent years, a thoroughfare now that cuts through the community. There is also the Mount Calvary and AM, AUMP church, which is the oldest, I think only a year younger than Trinity church in all of Towson. There is the Carver Colored High School, which was one of only three schools in all of Baltimore County where African-American children could be educated. They could only be educated to the 11th grade. And then if they wanted to graduate, they had to go inside the city to Dunbar or Douglas High. And so when you come out of that triad, you can make your way over to uh, what is it called? Mount Calvary, an AME church that's just a couple of years younger than, than um, Mount Olive, which lets you know there was a little bit of a little bit of tension, religious tension in the community, and a whole other group spun off from that. When you cut through Bentley Park, you come on to the Pride of Towson Lodge, which is this year 95 years old, the oldest social hall in the community where people have everything from uh, repasts, uh, milestone birthdays. We now actually have it as the center of our Juneteenth Music Festival. We're going this year into our third year. And so what you see here is these are often structures. There's also, there are also two log houses in Towson. One of them is the, thank you, the Jacob House. <laughs> and the other also um, 
It doesn't have a house. It's not the foot house, but there's another one also. Beautiful, fully restored places. So here is the charter, I believe, from Goucher. We have this in here to show you that Goucher was amongst, I believe, the first institutions of higher learning to have exclusionary language stricken from its charter. So Kent Devereaux, the president of Goucher, is leading the charge in that regard. And here we have uh, what we call in this image <laughs> C, that 2.8 acres of wooded area. And this is where we consider developers and the county government as putting a noose around the whole community. So lynching, we got lynching as of, I believe, March of this year is a federal crime. And what you'll see if you look carefully is that lynching continues to occur only in subtle now. You don't hang a person from a tree. You don't burn their body because that is now socially unacceptable. And so you find other ways to do it. And so you do that by not naming a community in a conversation about development. You do it by claiming you've talked to the NAACP. And so you thought if the NAACP was on board, then the community was on board. You, you function at the organizational level so that you don't have to come down on the ground and find out what's really happening. So the mistake that was made in Baltimore County is that the engine was turned on and moved on this project. Money was spent in exchange hands and the community was just told what was going to happen, not asked, what do you think? How can we work this out together? And so these are, I've already talked to you about these. These are the three churches that anchor the community, uh, St. James, Mount Olive, and Thank you, Mel Calvary. Uh, this is a celebrated historian, Lewis Diggs, who wrote 13 books on the 40 African-American communities in Baltimore County alone. And he's standing on that fateful day in May of 2021 when the Howard Cooper uh, marker de dedication happened. And that's the school where only African-American children could go. These are some interior and exterior shots of that, of those two log cabins I mentioned to you. This is our Confederate monument. This is a mm -hmm. substation, an electrical substation. It sits right in the middle of four of the only six blocks left in our community. It takes up two and a half acres of land. It is the front yard view or the backyard view of four of the remaining six blocks of East Towson. I am convinced, I went on a tour with some ladies a week or so ago and I said, come on, let's take a picture in front of this. I said, cause somebody's gonna put it in a book and you're gonna be able to see where it used to be. Mm -hmm. It's been there for almost 60 years. And so uh, the value of the Freedom Trail is in fact, about the community that is gathering around it. It is that community that has me standing before you here today discussing it. It is community at the governmental level. The county is interested. We are very much in partnership with Goucher College and uh, the Hampton National Historic Site. We are planning a bridge that extends over 695 that reconnects the landmass because it had been connected at one time. Had more thoughtful plans been made at the when the highway was run through, they may have gone under that land instead of getting rid of it altogether. And so we feel that the most appropriate response is to build a land bridge, a wildlife corridor, a wildlife and human corridor that honors the history and the possibility of a future connecting all of Towson. And so here you have it. Five miles is just long enough to contemplate not only the journey of freedom taken by former slaves, but the sojourn of freedom that lives and evolves in all of us. All of us. We are all 
to my mind, bound by something. Whether we have taken the time to self-examine long enough to find out what it is is immaterial. You can figure that out on the trail. Uh, I ask that you continue to reflect on the power of community. We are very far along in this process. We are in the midst of a feasibility study and all stakeholders are at the table. Fortunately for us, development has been our friend in that 80%, 90% of this trail is already public open space, which means what's required is signage, wayfinding, public art, archaeological opportunities, symposiums, not so different from this one, on the history and helping people to understand why this signature event is happening in our town. And so I thank you for having us, for having me especially, uh, for being willing to open your hearts and your ears and your minds to what is happening on the ground. Thank you. Well, thank you to our presenters for some very stimulating presentations and just, yeah, it's, it's always a joy to, to learn from, from colleagues. So at this time, I think we can just open things up to conversation. If you're on Zoom and would like to ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, and if you're live, feel free to ask your question and hopefully we'll be able to hear you uh, out in the Zoom world. Yes. Can you uh, comment on whether there's any other similar projects to recreating a trail like that in communities across the country? Can you repeat the question? Can we get up there and do it? Yeah, we're, we're actually going to do this. But if you could just repeat the question. The question was um, Are there other communities doing the same type of work creating a trail? I know that there are at least there are at least two communities who are investigating. They're at the investigation stage of connecting their community's history with a trail. Um, there's also a big campaign in Baltimore County right now for trail connectivity. We have a trail called the NCR Trail, which has some pretty deep history. And so the, the Road to Freedom Trail would actually pass right through the center of Jahard of Towson and act as a hub of connectivity for other trail systems in the area. That's what I know about so far. Thank you. So follow up to that. I thought it was interesting is how you frame it as a solution to a problem. Can you speak to why, why it feels fresh or what's appealing to County planners or about a trail. Well, and what what failed before? Uh, well, it's a it's a new idea. I don't think anyone's ever thought about it, discussed it. And the thing that makes it a solution is that in our uh, literature about the trail, we discuss it as a history <laughs> hidden in plain sight. So often, what I heard in sharing anything about East Towson was that number one. Not only did they not know Hampton was ever there, let alone that it's still there, they had no idea where this little Black community came from. And so it's an opportunity to connect those dots on that history throughout. And, and the fact that it literally leaves throughout Towson, it's not an East Towson Trail, it's in Towson. So it is, when I spoke earlier about the, the, the value and the necessity of it being inclusive, it is for all of Towson to see and experience. I'm fascinated by your trail. I'm yes. taking notes. I'm asking the question, is there a development of an African-American trail for Williamsburg? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I saw it. They presented that, but it has not been done. Oh, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I took note on the concept of paper lynching. You know, uh, and I said, so know that how that's subtly done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, uh, yeah, there is a, a trail that we uh, work on. I have been subject 
standard, but I believe it's nothing except that I was there. Yeah. Yeah. They came. The city came to a group of people with this idea without communicating with people in the community. And therefore, I'm one of the people that attended the meeting, and I personally was born in Williamsburg. I'm 82 years old. And what they want to do is not what I lived mm -hmm. in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. yeah. Understood. Like most stories. Understood. Yours was more of a community initiative. Absolutely. That's where it began. This one was kind of said, here's what we want to do. Right. With that, we that, got that, the community engagement, which that's the piece that mm -hmm. is making yours so rich. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have the buy in from your community. And I will, I will say, um, there we had an invitation to allow the county to take it on. We'll we'll take care of mm -hmm. the feasibility study, and I said no, thank you. Mm -hmm. And really, with regard and respect for community, there are just too many people too invested in the vision, the mission, and the the goals. Of the road to freedom trail at this point to just hand it off to the government and take what they give us too many people have spent too many hours in front of their or should i say inside of their hollywood squares which is what i, what I call zoom boxes uh, because this like the maryland lynching memorial project this came up hot and heavy during covid so where covid was had its certainly had its downside for me as an advocate it was fantastic because I could just join and leave, join and leave, join and leave. I went to three meetings in one night mm -hmm. that I could have never attended if I had to get up and get in my car and go from place to place. That's, that those are decisions I didn't have to make. But I completely identify with this idea that, well, what I'm learning from you is that had we turned it over to the government, they would have quite possibly done the same thing and told a story it was not the Towson that, that I grew up in, that the people in my community grew up in. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, thank you. It's been a great panel. Uh, is there any connection between the Hampton Plantation and the school to uh, Towson University? No, no not that I know of. Okay. Now, so I will say, well, yeah, well, keep in mind what has happened is that the, the, the land has gotten sold off over the years, but there's not a, what I would call a direct line connection between the Richley family and Towson University that I know. Of. There is, uh, and Jenny, you might know it. There, so I do believe that part of the land is now at Towson University, but most likely part of the plantation, and there's actually, um, was a house at its time that was built by a descendant of the Richland um, that is now used as part of the university. So it's know. the same area. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Okay. Everything is touching each other. For as far as the eye can see. Thank you. Sure. Great panel. Enjoy to all. Did I understand you said that young Howard Cooper was said to have attacked the woman for three hours is that what i've heard you say yeah i i yeah. mean that that's kind of the the story was that it would it was a couple hours so i don't know if it's like the time that she in which she was missing you know i don't think they kept count of the time but it was the time between when she dropped her sister off at the train station and she was walking home which was a wooded and it's still a wooded area now and by the time she arrived at her um, home on, on the porch of our house. I understand that young Mr. Cooper said that, okay, okay, so yes, I uh, affronted her, but I did not rape her. Is there any more details as to what he said did happen? He said he, he beat her for the devilment of it, is what he said. Um, he had had some run ins prior to that, um, even with the Ryder family. Uh, you know, and, and we can never look back and diagnose anyone with anything. And so I, I try not to do that sort of thing. But the fact in which everybody knew Howard makes me think that he was a part of the community. Um, 
And so uh, they knew each other, at least by sight, and could say uh, hello to each other. Um, but both of them, it was only the doctor who said that she had been raped. So the doctor who came to her, um, he's the one who claimed that. But she said, and Howard both said, that never happened. She and Howard both said that never happened. Right. Only the doctor. Only the doctor. Um, can I just hop in here real quick? Just, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the voice for any other disembodied voice. Um, I think it's important to, you know, remember when we think about this, and again, I appreciate, you know, the, the degree, uh, you know, to which, you know, Jenny, you, you've uncovered so much, but I think when we talk about ostensible confessions, you know, during lynching processes, we got to remember that these were not necessarily, you know, willing confessions. I mean, we, we have these problems today with forced confessions. Um, or, you know, people just being worn down in interrogation rooms, right? And so you dial this back a hundred some years um, where you don't have Miranda rights or anything like that happening. And then throw on top of that, that this is a 15 year old child. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we have to say, yeah, he said, you know, he, he, he beat her for the devilment of it. I mean, did he really do that or, or was this basically his way of trying to maybe mitigate, you know, the the weight of the state bearing down upon him? I mean, we just don't know. Um, also, and the other thing, you know, that in my research that I've, you know, come across, you know, again, um, why am I blanking, um, you know, woman who, you know, um, you know, sort of, you know, leading, you know, anti-lynching advocate, um, Ida B. Wells, frequently said that, you know, allegations of rape or, or of sexual assault was basically code for the existence of a, of a clandestine interracial relationship, which at that time would have been illegal. And so that, that you know, could that have been you know, the cover that was given to kind of explain, well, why is this, you know, 20 year old white woman, you know, involved in a relationship? You know, we can't talk about that. That's gonna offend the sensibilities of the community or, you know, certain parts of the community. Um, and so this is the, the fiction that was developed to, to explain or to kind of cover, you know, those kinds of things. Now, again, I don't have, hard evidence that that was the case, that there was a relationship between Katie Gray and, and Howard Cooper. We will probably never know. But I think, you know, that's another something that you have to think about when you're dealing with, you know, ostensible confessions. And especially, you know, in those cases where, you know, the lynching involves, a you know, an ostensible alleged, you know, um, allegations of rape or, or sexual assault. Also, added the the Baltimore Sun, which is the newspaper, because I was owned at that time. I'm going to blank on the individual's name and mm -hmm. but able. Everybody knew, you know, these are all white leading families in the late 1800s. They all knew each other. They were. We didn't get the true story through the Baltimore Sun and the research. We got some of these facts that are not facts, but some of the information that's shared. Is it a fact or not? We don't know. But uh, the Sun. Yes. Just at the end of what oh. last year? Um, they're doing going through their own truth and reconciliation process to the Baltimore Sun. But when we invited them to attend the um, Baltimore County Truth and Reconciliation hearing to give sort of the newspaper story of Howard Cooper's lynching, they chose not to participate in that. So that was on the heels of them publishing this article saying, we're going through this process, but no, we're not going to come in engage in the truth and reconciliation here. Oh, I'm sorry, then there's a woman in the back who's been waiting patiently. Um, yes, do we have any idea how many enslaved people actually worked on the Yes, campaign? yes. Let me just tell you, mm -hmm. the Ridgelys were meticulous record keepers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at its height, the Hampton Plantation probably had upwards of five, 500 over slaves, over 500. And the, the, the confusion lives in the fact that the some people had the same name 
And so you were very Jim and, and, and Sue's Joe kind of thing. Uh, at the point of manumission, 375 to 377 people and manumission was staggered, which meant that it was not a universal freeing of those people who were enslaved. As a woman, you had to be 24 to 45. A man was 28 to 46. If you were younger than that, you remained enslaved. If you were older than that, you remained enslaved. Uh, the whole thing, the, this notion that a slave was spent by 45, 46 years old speaks volumes mm -hmm. for the level of, of cruelty and the amount of work that, you know, shoot, when I was a kid, what they say, life begins at 40. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you were considered up for your social security only you weren't really going to get social security. Mm -hmm. And and if you had, if you were 24, you're a 24 year old woman and you have a, uh, you know, an eight year old, how far away are you going to go if your eight year old is still enslaved, which is why we suspect East Housing was even settled. Um, Hampton National Historic Site has published their ethnographic research. It's on, if you go to the National Park Service and you track your way over to Hampton, they have that information on the site. So they're really, they're trying to be much more transparent than, say, the Baltimore stuff. Yes, it's called Tracing Lives, Tracing Lives in Slavery. Speaking of the Baltimore Sun, I'm just curious, uh, to what degree did it cover this lynching? It, it definitely it covered the lynching along with other local newspapers, um, but nobody in the lynch mob was named. Right. In the, and we searched, um, I shouldn't say we, I was not part of the actual research team, but Jenny and others who are more archivally trained really dug deep far and wide. The Chicago um, Tribune at that time, was the Tribune? Chicago paper was publishing every known lynching. Right. Um, so there's a rec, that's a good source of information. And, the story and then what we ended up finding was that um, a paper like out the mid out in the Midwest actually named the um, perpetrator of the mob. So it was known, you know, and a lot of times what happens is is that the AP sends out this generic story. So we see the same story over and over in, in papers. So it was obviously at one point in that story, and it was about who was going to actually publish it. And so the sheriff had identified who was in front of the mob, who was the mob leader. Uh, it was just that nobody else decided to publish it. And a lot of the um, accounts almost seemed like first person, as if someone was there, um, or at least had definite knowledge uh, in the way in which they went minute by minute and how this happened and who said what and what did it sound like. Um, and it's really important to remember this is the middle of a community. So I like to, you know, draw back into my senses. This is July in Baltimore. So it's not January when your house is closed up. People had their windows open. This, you know, this mob is coming from a direction going through on horseback. This isn't silent and it's at midnight. So any kind of, um, you know, ambient noise that's happening is really hushed at that point. So people know that this is happening. And 75 people, again, in the newspaper, they wanted to claim that it was from the third district, from the district in which she lived in. But we know the mob leader lived a uh, stone's throw away from the jail. So that couldn't have been possible. And I'm sorry, for folks who are online, I'm hearing that there's requests for chats for um, the links to the Hampton Plantation. Um, I'm not able to pull it up right now just because of our format. So if somebody else has done it, it'll be perfect. Thanks. And I think there's been a question in the back. Yeah, yeah, well, it's kind of twofold. I, one of the kind of ones, maybe that's from the bill I was asking is uh, about the mob, but uh, to us, in that nothing ever was the came of by hands unknown. unknown. Uh, pardon me? By hands unknown. No, no my party was party. Nobody's ever been charged or held well, out of and, and the second one, um, we have. Nat Turner's um, story, um, we've had several people, at least that I have just had the descendants of Nat Turner, his fam, um, the white families, and also jail people that had been a part, and they, they kind of came together in the conversation. And what was interesting about it is that the person who interpreted what Nat Turner 
through confession, so to speak, was very different than what, of course, so it was written by a white person who um, told his own, their own story. So yeah, I mean, um, we don't know. They have story. Yeah, well, we just don't know what it is that um, in these stories, like you said, it's been showing that these things are happening now. Um, right. Confessions come and are not all completely. So. We've um, gotten involved and in touch with the descendant of the leader of the mob, and she actually came to our hearing and gave a testimony. Um, and you know, she had never heard this story. Mm. Uh, it's her great grandfather at this point, um, and her mother had not heard the story. Um, but I think the important thing was for her when she was coming is also recognizing trauma mm -hmm. and um, you know how that plays generationally. And there were some questions she had asked herself about how this relates to relationships and, and the, the status of people in her family and you know how, even if it wasn't talked about because Milton actually died quite early, um, but that, it, you know, his wife ended up with his brother, so still keeping him in the family. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what did that do to their family? You know, and and recognizing privilege, and um, and you know, and that's what that history. Milton actually was buried in that church in which I did the research. Mm -hmm. So um, again, there's another connection there. So I was going to add that the um, Maryland County. Truth and Reconciliation hearing that was held this past June is on. Um, there's links to the um, it's on the YouTube video, really? the Modern Age. Um, so you can go to the Maryland Lynching and Memorial Project site and click through and find the hearing. I think it's a couple of parties. Yeah. I'm not sure where we are with the time. I was going to say, yeah, we are actually over time, but also just to let you know that the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission has um, links to to the you know the hearings that that we've held so far, all five of them. Um, so that might also be another resource for you to to examine it. And, and again, you can just pop into Google the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and and that will come up. Um, but again, I would like to thank our panelists for such wonderful presentations and thank you all for the rich conversation that we've had. Um, I, again, thank you all and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you. Thank you.